Hello and welcome to another edition of the Restless Entertainment Questions Edition. I'm Marina Hyde. Well, yep. Uh, I'm Richard Osmond, Question and Answers Edition. You're very, very welcome, everybody. Um, Lo lovely to have you with us. How can it be? It's, it's like a half-life. It's degrading all the time. It's getting worse. Our intro. Yeah. Yeah, it's My intro, that. let's be honest. <laughs> No, Let's this, call it what it is, Richard. Yeah, but you're doing the heavy lifting at the beginning. Oh, yeah. God, I, I, was, I mean, really, I, I could never do what I do. I couldn't introduce that show. I don't know how you do it. Honestly, I do not know how you do it. Well, you hear, yeah. you hear how I do it. Let now, me go, welcome along. No, I can't do it. I get along. Welcome please along. Please, can you hit me with a question? Just put me out of uh, my misery. Of course. Cod cuddle me to death with a question. Uh, Matthew Bell asks, I'd like to know, what is the average lead-in time from an actor getting the part to the first day on set? That is a great question and it completely varies. Sometimes you get a part many months in advance or if you're playing it in a TV series and you know you're going to be the lead actor. The shorter ones can be relatively quick um, and you might find if they're, if you're just doing a short character arc or you're doing essentially a cameo, cameo episode, you could get, get that job quite quickly. Um, and so it's, as I've said before, actors are amazing and they instinctively understand these parts so quickly. Um, when in a way that is always extraordinary to people who've been working on them for months and sometimes years before. But there are some really interesting examples from movie history of people who absolutely take a part and make it theirs because either someone has had to pull out for one reason. I think Nicole Kidman was going to be in Panic Room and she pulled out almost right before it and Jodie Foster went in. And oh, really? that whole performance is last minute. But then there are things like in Jaws, Stephen... Um, Spielberg did not have Quint or Hope, the Robert Shaw character or the Richard Dreyfuss character, nine days before filming really? started. And when you think, I mean, that's almost like a three-hander, that movie. Yeah. Um, didn't even have the shark. Didn't the, <laughs> the shark, as yeah. we know, was very problematic. And it was uh, uh, it was a squid originally, <laughs> and then at the last minute it got. Uh, yeah, well, the shark ink. was so looked went malfunctioned so often and looked so you know looked wrong in so many things that necessity being the mother of, of invention, he had to essentially take it out of it quite a lot and and just use the idea of it. And so you saw it as an idea Clever. of pursuit. And yeah, it turned out quite well for him. Yeah, didn't it? Um, but there are really, you know, Viggo Mortensen in, as Aragon in Lord of the Rings. Um, P Peter Fa Jackson fired the guy who was Aragon on the first day. And so he had to come in. There's some really sad ones like that. Like Eric Stoltz, Back to the Future, originally had Eric Stoltz in it. And he started filming and they couldn't get Michael J. Fox. He was doing Family Ties, which is a big American sort of 80s sitcom. And then... They just saw it's not working with Eric Stoltz. And they basically began talks with Michael J. Fox and said we could film in the evenings after he's finished her family ties. So, but by the way, every time most of Back to the Future is filmed after Michael J. Fox has already oh done God. a whole day's work on a sitcom. I mean, what a... Uh, That's like Alexander Armstrong on Pointless. He does classical, classic FM in the morning, then he does Pointless. I mean, it's exactly the same as Michael very, J. Very, Fox. It's very, very similar. Very similar to the Back to the Future um, thing. But... Then, so they start shooting lots of scenes where they're only shooting um, Christopher Lloyd's coverage. <laughs> so you sort of, anyway. And then Michael J. Fox comes in and becomes Marty McFly. Um, but Hugh Jackman, uh, Wolverine, which is still going to be one of the big movies of the summer, um, Wolverine Deadpool, he, it was going to be Doug Ray Scott. And I think he got in, injured in Mission Impossible. And therefore, they pull, pulled in Hugh Jackman who said, I think this sounds stupid, this thing, but his wife said, uh, his wife at the time said, well, no, do it, people like this, or people are going to like this sort of yeah. stuff. Turned out to be quite a, a good decision. Yeah, didn't it? But there, there are huge numbers of people who come in at the last minute and make it work, and it is something to do with that instinctive understanding, and if the casting is right, then it can really work. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, as casting directors will tell you, quite quite often, I mean, you, you'll have a, a movie will be hung around a, a particular piece of talent. So, you know, if you are, say, talk about Thursday Murder Club, if you're Helen yep. Mirren and Pierce Brosnan and Ben Kingsley, it work out when, when do your schedules coincide? Yeah. And then that's when you film. And then you start working with everyone else. And there's lots of people who then can't do those yeah. dates, of course. Uh, and we're a couple of weeks out from filming at the moment. And as you know, with all movies or TV shows, you're writing right up to the last minute. I'm not writing, but it's, you know, being rewritten. And when you write and rewrite, characters get lost characters come in yeah so there's characters who are literally only just sort of going Coming in, in so, yeah. so people are, are, are auditioning right now for a, a movie that starts in two weeks time um so you know you'll get your tent pegs in and then some of the other roles are much much nearer the time so you'll get a part and you'll literally be on set next week you're a million percent the best person for the job but you don't have an awful lot of time to prepare for it. And I think that that's very uh, common with actors, isn't it? Sometimes you'll be like, it's very rare you'll get a job and say, look, it's in nine months' time. But very yeah. often you'll get a job and you say, look, you need to be in 
Wales in nine days' time. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of Chris Columbus, your director, yes. Joe Pesky for Home Alone was an unbelievably last-minute thing and thought, I don't oh, really, really want to do this. Why am I doing this? But anyway, turned up and aced it. Uh, I've, I went... Um, I've had one evening with uh, Chris Columbus. I'm looking forward to spending more time with him, and I'm going to get so many stories oh, about uh, about story Hollywood bankers. and about uh, Spielberg and about them. Spielberg's coming over as well, so we're going to get a load of stories. Um, throughout the summer, we'll be uh, any 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 Q and As uh, that I can give to Chris Columbus or Steven Spielberg. Just let me know. Yeah, just in the shareable file, please. Yes, in the shareable please file. Ask him to speak shareably, and of course, non shareably for your own personal consumption. Yes, exactly that. One for you, Richard, very much so, about darts cameras from oh, yeah. Kane Whitehead. I've recently been watching a lot of darts on TV and noticed that the production is very good at zooming into the right number or being on the number that the player is aiming for extremely quickly. How can the production team get the camera moved to such an accurate spot so fast? Uh, thank you, Kane. Kane Whitehead sounds like the name of a darts player. Yes, I think. it does. You know, just someone that gets knocked out in the last 16 of the Windmill Masters. Um, it's, it's an easy one, really. I mean... Darts, there are certain ways of coming down from certain numbers. So normally we know that someone's going for the 20s yeah. throughout most of the thing, uh, but they also know all of the players, so they know that sometimes they'll come down for a 19 if the bed is blocked. So they know for most of the game where they're heading. And at the end, when there's uh, checkouts, Again, there are very traditional ways of going for it. But alongside the producers and the, uh, alongside the directors, who are all incredibly experienced of shooting darts, throwing darts, shooting darts, <laughs> uh, they have ex-pros called spotters who will call where the player is going to go. So they will know the players very well. They'll know if they're on 111, they know exactly where they're going to go. If they And if they score that, they know where they're going to go. So you've got these spotters who will call out exactly where to go next. You've got camera operators who are very used to doing that crash zoom. Um, and you see it when it goes wrong. You see it when someone does something unexpected and you suddenly have to do a, <laughs> a sort of very quick whip pan. Yeah. But it's A, the predictability of what you would normally be going for, plus the fact that you do have professional former professionals and people who know the game of every single player literally sitting in the gallery calling out to you where to go next like a kind of I was of, going to ask if they're in the gallery yes yes they'll be in the they'll, they'll, they'll absolutely be in the gallery and also the commentators know where they're going to be heading all yeah. that stuff but the, the 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 shooting of darts is one of the great joys of british television it's just it's the perfect the, the you know the um the the um Split screen, yeah, which was invented by a camera operator in the seventies. Said, so would this help? Yeah, that helps. Uh, and you know, being able to have those close-ups on the board and on the player's face and all that kind of stuff. So, darts is. I just, I love the way darts is um, is filmed. You know, if you, it's one of the few things. With most sports, you want to introduce a friend to cricket or something. So, come watch a bit of the cricket and see how long they last. It'll be like four minutes tops. They go, what? Sorry, what is this? That even twenty twenty, they're going. Yeah, Sorry, I don't know what. What are you making me watch here? With darts, they'll do four seconds of, yeah, but why are they? And they go, oh, my God, oh, what's he going to do? Oh, wow. It's like it's so beautifully formatted and beautifully shot, the darts, that it's the, if you, if you, it's a very, very easy sport to get someone Yeah, it's, into. it's made it so accessible. All, yeah. of, it, all of those advances have made it even more accessible. And also because, weirdly, it has characters who you wouldn't cast in normal sports. And that's quite that's yeah. quite fun for people as well. There's there's always some sort of you go. Why has that guy got a green cockatoo haircut? And you think you know no, that's not like watching the tennis. That's not yeah. like Carlos Alcaraz. Uh, so I think yeah, I think uh, um, darts is one of is, is one of the great uh, TV sports. But yeah, spotters is the answer to that. But Kane Whitehead, definitively. If I was writing a book now about darts player. I might call him Kane Whitehead. That would be good. Yeah. K-A-Y-N-E as well, which yeah, is absolutely, which is yeah, perfect. On the money. Yeah. Thank you, Kane. Thank you so much, everyone, for sending in all your top threes. I love them. Uh, My enforced top three yeah, yeah, everywhere. I've got yeah. so many now. What I call the Marina Hyde enforced top three section <laughs> of the show. Uh, this one is from Kirsty Patrick. She asks, I would like to know your top three TV chefs. Kirsty says, I'll be disappointed if Gordon Ramsay doesn't feature. I would say, knowing you, knowing me, prepare to be disappointed. Prepare for disappointment. I, although, yeah, I no, I can't, I can't warm to him. Although my favorite, it, it was a good show when it came out. Which one? But the, the 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 original one, is it Kitchen Nightmares? Kitchen Nightmares. Yeah, where we go into yeah. some sort of regional restaurant and try and, you know, tart it they up. They still and make repeat them. the American one all the time on Channel Four in the morning. Yeah. And all you ever do, you watch it. It's always exactly the same episode, yeah. which is fine by me. Uh, and then you Google the restaurant and it always shut down six months after Gordon Lee. Yeah, always, I can, always. My favourite Gordon Ramsay moment was that Soccer Aid. We've 
which as, as you, we just had soccer aid, as mm. you know, it's a very, it's all in a good cause and there's celebrities playing actual footballers and there's a moment where Teddy Sheringham absolutely, just no, the, the ball is like a mi- somewhere else completely and Teddy Sharon absolutely classes him and it is, <laughs> I think he's stretched it off actually, Gordon Ramsay, because you know he's, he has that thing where he's, he, he's one of those people who sort of tells you they played for Rangers, but yes, I think, he I, did. think it, poli- I think politely, I would say that the, the account is not supported by the club's official archivist, I think oh, it's, a, it's is what we right? might politely term Gordon right? Ramsay's association, yes. Mm. Um, so no, he's not in my top three. I would have to say that is it, I mean, do you you don't watch him cook that much? But I'd have to say Anthony Bourdain. I think he's okay. the most one of the most incredible people. I'm a, 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 such a great loss. A really interesting, interested person. I think he's absolutely amazing. My number two is quite unconventional. It is. Uh, they're not real. They're, they're, they <laughs> there was a really small and short, but so good little program called Posh Nosh with Arabella Weir and Richard E. Grant. Okay. And they play a couple uh, and he's the sort of, who are TV chefs. Yeah. Um, and he's he's horrific. And she tries to be supportive of his wife called Minty, I think she is. And it, it's really funny. And it, it, it's, if you, that's that shot of, we all know, is sort of, you know, in a staged home kitchen. Yeah. The man and a woman as a sort of help meet. It's, it's really good and it's very good on lots of the conventions of those types of shows and on human relations in general. Very so funny. So Poshnosh, that'll be available Posh somewhere. Nosh. I don't know. You'll be able yeah, to yeah. find it. It's probably yeah. on YouTube. And my number one is Nigella. Ah. because And she would also say, I so maybe all of these are cheats because she'd say, I'm not a chef. I am a cook. But I, abs- I, I absolutely love all her food. I have all the books. I love her screen persona, which is really as all of these things. They have to be quite authentic. Is is her real persona? Yeah. Um, she is without any question. Um, and and just the way she talks about indulgence, and she doesn't apologise for things, and she'd never say the words guilty pleasures. I she she's really she she makes you and the way she's sort of quite inaccurate about things as she <laughs> says i'm so inaccurate and i burn things often because i'm trying to hurry up and she 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 is a sort of friend in the kitchen and i really felt during the pandemic when you know none of us ever went out anywhere and you were, yeah. and meals became a really important thing i felt like she was one of those people even though she, i wasn't watching her sometimes i would watch the tv programs but i was cooking for more her books at home and she was a real friend to have in the kitchen so she is my number one Shall I do my top three? Yes, please do. Um, t- number three, Keith Floyd. Yeah, <laughs> I was really hard to leave him off. Again, they show um, they they show old episodes of him on on Saturday Kitchen. They 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 go to Keith Floyd, and it's it's a, it's a very sort of early form of Gonzo. Yeah. Television. He was like the proto Clarkson. Yeah. Keith Floyd. Yes, you're but, right. Um, That's a really good way of looking at it. I hadn't thought of that. Very entertaining. Cooks well. Goes out into communities. Just you know. So I I, I love him. Number two, just because I love his passion and i think he's a great tv presenter again i always come at this from a producer's um point of view rather than a, a, a an eater's point of view I, I love rick stein yeah um i think he's brilliant i love him on television i love again his passion my number one again you've gone from from nigella because it's someone who sort of helps you in the kitchen i i would go for my number one from a tv producer's point of view which i i think is someone who 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 has turned the tv cookery show into into a, into a real art and again who connects incredibly well with viewers uh, and my number one would also be nigella that's nice that was a rug pull wasn't it yeah there yeah. you go oh, you see yeah she's great i mean it's, it's queen it's, of all she surveys quite rightly yeah she's really really terrific Noddy hussein is very very good yeah she's now, brilliant she, she, she's coming up on the uh, you know the rear i think but and all her recipes come out which sometimes they don't with these people that does matter yeah it does matter but yeah nigella is just she's created like a whole genre to herself and and and, and a warmth when you turn it on you know what you're watching it feels so beautifully shot and it's very very intimate as well so she's uh, and it's always about so much more than food just as her yes. writing was she always talked about the possibilities of food writing yeah. as someone that can take you into something much deeper and i I find it so interesting. I think she's brilliant on every on all the different levels. So we can double Nigella. And she is a yeah. As you say, she's a TV. Perf- I mean, a star yeah. was born. Yeah. This one is very much for you, Richard, because it's about the Taskmaster House. Oh yeah. I am obsessed with the Taskmaster House too, so I want to know the answer. James Wyatt says, "I imagine that at the start of the show, the house must have been rented by Avalon or Dave, but surely it must be so important to the Taskmaster brand now that it is owned by them." 
If so, how many series did it take to justify purchasing it outright? Do you know what? I thought exactly the same, James. Uh, funnily enough, I have to have some... Uh, uh, Andy Devonshire, who we, we did his favourite three ever Taskmaster tasks last week, and I stupidly said Rosie Jones instead of Rose Matafeo. For the chickpea uh, funeral. Chick uh, funeral. It was, it was, of course, Rose Matafeo. So apologies to Andy, because uh, he certainly told me it was Rose Matafeo. That was my own poor brain. Um, and really, I was talking to Andy about the house as well, because obviously I, I did Taskmaster in Series 2, and the Taskmaster house is quite not a million miles from where I live. Uh, and... They constantly, um, someone keeps putting the location on Google Maps. Yes, you know, I know. I've looked at it before. You know on Google Maps where it will tell you various yeah. places and they're constantly trying to get it taken down because people go along and actually... It's a black site. Don't get yeah, <laughs> They exactly. make it like they're a CIA allowed, black site. It's like site. CIA. If you look from yeah, Google yeah. Maps, it's literally just a, a crater. Yeah. Um, if you do go along, there's not an awful lot you can see, is the truth. There's quite high gates. You can see the gates are high, yeah. Yeah, So it, it's it's and also it, it's on quite a busy main road as well. So it's not like yes. a... That is another part yeah. of it that you can tell. Yeah, and it's nowhere near the tube. Do they own it now? Now, I assume they did. They still rent it. They still rent it, which is which I guess because right from the start. That's the had, London rent look. Even yeah. even the producers of a hit even, series even cannot actually buy in London. Yeah, it's, it's exactly that. And it in and it's a it's a funny little house. It looks like, I assume it was, it was like a gatehouse to something. It's very near a big um uh gym one of the you know the, the big complexes which i assume maybe that had a manor house and this was the like a little tiny gatehouse yeah. to, to that that's what it feels like it's at the start of a big long drive um yeah, it's a very unusual place because i don't think anyone would really want to live in it if that makes sense it's in a very unusual place if you want to look yeah. at it as a house you'd be like well i mean this is i'm literally at the junction of two really busy yeah. roads there's no other houses around there's not it's and it's quite an unusual house. I'm not even sure if there's any bedrooms. I'm not, I'm not even sure if there's an upstairs. I don't think there is. It doesn't have a feel of an upstairs. Yeah. You sometimes feel the, the little room where they go to might be upstairs, where, they, where the little room with the things at the shelves and the... No, there's 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 um, there's um the main room with the, with the picture of yeah. Greg and, the, and the, the nice things, which is sort of a living room. There's a very, oh, very small kitchen. Yeah. There's a dressing room, which is the one room you never ever see, which is where the uh, contestant yeah. sits while they're waiting for the task to be set up, like just a little dressing room with a little desk looking out over a just a fence. I mean, there's, there's no yeah. view at all, so you just sit there and read the papers and have a cup of tea, and you can hear all these noises outside as they're kind of moving things anything. into I mean, place. Really it could, could be, be anything. anything. <laughs> but, yeah, so I... Yeah, it, it, I don't think it's really something that anyone buys as a house. So, yeah, they rented it right at the beginning uh, and they're still renting it now, kind of 18 series in or or whatever they are. So, yeah, it's. Uh, I would say if you're a fan of Taskmaster, there's not an awful lot to see if you do go and visit that house. Very occasionally when they're filming, they'll get noise from outside as people are trying to see in. You can't, you can't see in. Uh, and they have to just go, I'm really sorry, you just have to... So even if you go there when people are filming, all you're going to be is an annoyance and you'll be asked to move and it will be a you know a runner asking you to move rather than James Acaster. <laughs> so there's yeah there's there's not a huge amount in the tourist attraction of the Taskmaster house but yeah it's uh, it's always been in the same place it's um it's anyone who lives in West London it's really near their house so when you get a task where it's like order this or you just go oh that's easy because I, I i know I've, I've got the number of all the local cabbies <laughs> and i've got the number of all the local takeaways this should be okay uh it's by the river um and that you know it's uh it's yeah but it, it is rented but i cannot imagine anyone ever actually buying it. Although now, of course, you'd be buying the Taskmaster house. You'd be house, buying so. the Taskmaster I hope the landlord's not a real sort of rentier capitalist and sort of put the rent, rent up ridiculously and then says, and actually now I'm selling it as the Taskmaster house. That I will find out. But knowing Avalon as I do, I don't care what sort of landlord you are, you're not going to be a harder bastard than I was, Avalon. I was about to say, <laughs> I forgot it was that, that, they, that was who yeah. they were dealing with. I mean, that, They'd probably like, get it for free now. Yeah, I was going to say the landlord <laughs> going, I'm going to absolutely play hardball here. Yeah, Avalon, good luck. Ro Avalon rolling up their sleeves going, oh, oh yeah. Hardball, we know okay. how to play that way. Here's a task for you. Um, Marina, one for you. Sam Smith uh, has written in, I'm assuming the pop star. Of course, just as always as you. Sam Smith asks, I've always wondered how the channel numbers get decided. How competitive is it to get higher up the channel list? And does it make much of a difference nowadays? Oh, right, Sam. Well, it makes 
slightly less difference than it used to, but it's still hugely important. Um, and they used to trade. They used to. They, they, there are whole companies that will sell slots on the EPG. That's the Electronic Programming Guide. Um, it's called slot trading. I mean, they, they can go for twenty million pounds <laughs> because it really matters where you are in that. Um, in, in those slots and most people have a sort of hierarchy in the way they navigate their TV and still most people will turn their TV on and see what is on yep. and then they will look at the linear EPG then if there's any and they'll do that by the linear EPG then they'll look at if they've got any recordings you know that they've of things that they want to watch and then they might browse on demand so that is still although it may not be the way as always it may not be the way you do it it is still the way yeah. most people do it um, and live is very important still. And there's lots of things that people might want to watch live, either because they want to do it with second screens and talk about it while they're watching it, or because that's simply, it's a, obviously things like sport, it goes without saying. Um, it's funny, one of the things is like the HD channels, which are the sort of normal oh, broadcast channels. Oh, they're so channels. hard to find. Okay, they're really hard to find. Only 15, uh, because they're really far down in the yeah. EPG, only 15% of people watch those channels oh, really? they, they people are people prize laziness far more than they prize picture quality i do certainly yeah I can't, so do i my eyesight's so yeah. bad anyway it doesn't <laughs> matter hctv is a waste of money for i'm me. going to have to go down to sorry 2000 and what now yeah, yeah it's really nobody wants to do this okay um now freely which is the update it, it's is the updated version of freeview for people who want to have free television um now the new media act will give prominence that they just managed to get in the washing up period just before Parliament finished. They realised that they were going to give prominence on the, the EPG to, they actually put that into law to the on-demand players so that the, the, you know, the BBCs and the big broadcasters, the public service broadcasters. Yeah. But what they didn't do, they omitted to do, was to give prominence to the EPG itself. Okay. Yes, so they didn't actually do that. So, But... They still do remember, the broadcasters always insist with manufacturers when they're making the remote controls that they still have numbers on them. Yeah. And that's because they do, otherwise you could just have your button for Netflix, you could have your button for whatever. Yes, that's true. But, yes, but, yeah. But it's really important. And the reason they insist it is because it's because where you are and where you are in those slots is still really important and people yeah. know the numbers. And they absolutely insist that manufacturers have to produce them with numbers on the remote control. Cause like they, like every one of my generation, my my... Our remote control, my grandparents' remote control, always you couldn't see the one and the three because they've been yeah. worn out, and the yeah. two and the four were like, I mean, yeah. I've, okay. I've, I've, I've never watched it. <laughs> um, so, this, so this new thing, so with the freely, it won't, so the EPG just won't appear on your front page or. What you need to do is still, it, it's really wrong not to give prominence to the, they should have done that. And I, it, it, this could be amended. You want to give prominence to the linear EPG because linear is still really important. People keep saying, oh, end of broadcast, that's the end of linear. It's not at all. It's not at all the end. People want that. There's lots of things you can do within linear, linear channels. Um, and so those slots still remain important, slightly less than they were, but still very, very important. And that's why they go for these kind of huge numbers, because uh, it really matters. And obviously, the lower down you are, the yes. better, because people honestly get bored after two and a half pages. Well, there's always, I think it's because some people's remote control can only go in one way. So, so if you're flicking up a program number, it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But some of them go back the other way. So if you press downwards from BBC One, I think you get to like Radio Essex yes, Digital you do, and go or back something. To all the, yeah. And I would love, this is something, if anyone out there knows that, I would love to know if the ratings for Radio Essex Digital are substantially higher than for pretty much any other radio station because so many people accidentally press, press down yeah, instead online of Online you can go, yeah, and yeah. you can go back. And I often find myself on those things and think, how did I go here? But it's, it's, quite, it's quite literally a simple slip of the thing. Yes, they should be is the answer to that. And Anything in the back, the middle of the carousel is yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, 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 dead, is, is, dead. is in real trouble, like yeah. gem, like Gems TV, yeah, and stuff like that. It's like it's like a weird day when you're when you're scrolling that far down that you're getting into yeah, all, yeah. all Gems TV plus one. But you know, there's amazing things stuck in the middle. Talking Pictures TV is is quite a long way down it, and that's an unbelievable channel. And the hundreds are big because people know the hundreds. So oh, okay, when yeah. you know, if you're doing like if for something like on Sky five oh one for the news, yeah, yeah. they make that e e and then they put five oh three for the BBC, which was a big bone of contention. But anyway, they so they they those once you get to a hundred and you think, yeah. okay, now I'm into the shopping, or I'm now I'm into the yeah. that matters kids news. Yeah, the one thing right at the end of the EPG now on on lots of. LG, I don't know about the others. 
that is going to be huge and at the moment isn't, I suspect it's because where they are on the EPG is all the fast channels, which are the free yeah. ad-funded um, ones, where it's literally 24-hour-a-day um, homes under the hammer or 24 hours a day, you know, um, nothing to declare or just like a whole channel of this stuff, which actually I think the second people find them, you know, 24-hour escape to the country, yeah. Okay. If they did a bit of slot trade, yeah, they, yeah, those channels are becoming, as you say, much, much more significant. Yeah, yeah. And if they end up because they're doing, they do better and better, they will slot trade and they will go further, much, much further up in the EPG, and we'll be able to see from who thinks <laughs> the homes under the hammer channel is really worth, you know, which yeah. by the way would be worth a lot. Yeah, it, it, who who thinks that they're doing particularly well by by how low they buy in the yeah. EPG? And there's like 24 hour pointless you can just watch that the whole time it's interesting paramount make a huge amount of their money from these fast channels people are making more and more and more which is just taking your catalog and just putting them one after the other so you can always dip in you can always see something of a, of, of a show that comforts you or that you love and uh yeah at the moment you can have a little scroll through your thing they're right at the bottom there's loads of them um but uh, I, th I think they'll get uh, they will get bigger and bigger and bigger it's interesting where, where sorry this is a sort of sidebar but where we which, which people who do who do um who who does these sort of buyout things when i was on the plane i went on ba to um, the us it was so hard not to watch a paramount show because they've obviously got done a deal a and lot. everything you see for so long is, you know, Yellowstone or Tulsa King, whatever, which is yeah. fine by me. Um, but you, it, it was really interesting. I thought, God, it's actually quite hard to see that they've got anything else. Yeah. Because they run you through absolutely every single Paramount thing. Yeah, it's one of those things where please tick this box if you don't not want to watch a yeah. Paramount yeah. Plus show. Hold on yeah. a minute, do I? It oh, was... I'm just going to watch one. It was yeah because because we're lazy. Yeah, yeah. We prize laziness as humans over almost everything else, especially in terms of our TV. We certainly do. Thank you for listening, everyone. <laughs> okay, Riot Twenty Four via YouTube asks us, "What are your top TV theme tunes, please?" Top three TV theme tunes. Yeah, absolute classic, textbook stuff. Um, I'm just going to come straight out. Number three. I'm going to say Rent a Ghost. I was God. I was going. I nearly put that in my no. top three. I was thinking about it. It's so brilliant. You're not really supposed to um, uh, quote lyrics because then you have to clear them. But, uh, you know, to pray see them, if you have a mansion house and it were to require haunting, who might you call? Yeah. You might call the people at Rent-A-Ghost. Well, I love any show that explains it itself in the, uh, in the, in the, in the theme tune. Exactly, like Beverly Hillbillies yeah. and things like that. So this is the idea of this show. The Fresh Prince is a full Fresh Prince is different well, strokes. But it's good because some people, their, their entire pilot is this is the idea of the show. Yeah. If you've just got someone singing. Yeah. What the idea, which by the way, my number one is also one of those. Um, number two, because I it's listen, it's cheating really because it's not a theme tune, it's a it's a commercial song that's used as a theme song, which people do a lot, is um Peep Show, which uses Flagpole yeah. Sitter by um Harvey Danger, which is an absolute cracker. And my number one, again, it's a it's a song that describes what's gonna happen in the show and who the star of the show is. Um, it might be, uh, it's written by a Canadian gentleman. Uh, and it's a show, do you know what, I was talking about the show the other day and, and there's a certain generation who do not know this show at all. It's completely got lost. So the first thing I want you to do at the end of this episode is go and look up the music to this song. Uh, and it's uh, The Littlest Hobo. Oh. There's a voice keeps on calling yeah. me. All of that. And I could sing, and again, I'm not allowed to sing it, but in my head I'm always I'm singing it. I'm just about to quote the full lyrics. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, yeah. you're not allowed to. Um, somewhere, yeah, that's it's a really good story. A story of the week explainer. Hi, yeah, this it is really story is. of the week show because so, so, I have to keep moving on. Littlest Hobo was a yeah was a was a, a dog an Alsatian who essentially um, would turn up in various places. Somehow, I must watch some more Littlest Hobo because I, I don't know how the writers pull it off. Would somehow solve some problem swiftly ingratiate or, himself. swiftly ingratiate himself <laughs> yeah for some meat. Got to be a uh, good tourist. And then uh, you turn around. And he's gone again. Yeah. You know, every stop he makes. left things just a little bit better than how he found them. Exactly. The littlest hobo. Um, would you have a top three on that? Okay, my top three are, it's really hard because I want to sport one and I, I am, and it's, oh. it's tricky. I was grandstand, obviously, but I think I'm going to go with the uh, former test match cricket on the BBC. Which, yes. It's called Soul Limbo. And yeah, that's by Booker a, T. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. it's also Ski Sunday. Yes, Key Sunday was yeah. brilliant. And yeah. Also, on my Desert Island Discs, I had the music to the snooker. That was oh, on my you? Desert Island Discs, yeah. Well, funny enough, I, and yet I haven't the... put it in my top three. Yet. You see, speak <laughs> of Desert Island, that's a, there's a 
great Tom Stoppard play called The Real Thing, and he he's a, in which the lead character is a playwright who's being asked to. Um, I think he's a playwright, but he's being asked to choose his desert island disc songs, and he keeps thinking, you know, you want to choose something that's really intellectual that makes you know, but actually your best ones are, and this is going to inform what my number one is. So I'll come oh, back really? to that later. Yeah, the, yeah, I'm not choosing. You know, I should probably choose something. Number two, I'm going to choose the, the succession theme because it's oh, so it's odd. It's brilliant. Yeah. It's so discordant yeah. and weird and it's such a mood that, yeah. I mean, and that's amazing when you think of, obviously you see the pictures and so you understand yeah. certain things about the show, but the kind of discordance of that is it gets you into such a mood before and it yeah. goes on and it's a long one you can when you've got an hour's television you can put an, a full hbo hour you've got yeah. the, the entire hour there's no advertising you can get quite into and I, I i think it's so amazing and it really you know and people had it as their phone ring and it, yeah, it, yeah. there's something really unusual and strange about it your and top three is much better than my top three for someone who's reluctant to do top, top three <laughs> you're very good at them what well, number one and number one because it's joyous it's got the it's an oral explanation but it does count as part of the theme tune is the A team, okay. Oh, so I, because yes. I uh, I know yes. those words still, but and if sorry, you're, most people will be too young for this. But please just go on YouTube and watch this whole thing, um, because there's a voice that tells you their backstory, the character's backstory, and then it goes segues into the actual theme tune, which is extremely rousing. Yes. I actually came back down the aisle at my wedding on the way back down the aisle to the A team. No yes. way, did you? Not the bit, but the, not the voice. Only, <laughs> which would have been like, you right? Cut that bit we've, off. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was to the, to the, yeah. We came back to things can only get better. <laughs> <laughs> I walked down the aisle to Lose Yourself by Eminem. <laughs> Uh, you did it, all, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, you God, only get one shot, all of that, and um, and Ingrid walked down to the Long and Winding Road. Oh, so I kind of I I g'd them up, yeah, and then uh, then the whole place in 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 floods. Your top three is much better than mine. I want no, it to, wasn't. Yeah, oh, but thank you very well. Thank you very much. Well, listen, I, I can't believe I'm using this phrase. But keep sending us your top threes. <laughs> keep you sending see? keep sending us your questions and top yeah, threes and top threes. Um, the address is the rest is entertainment at gmail dot com. That was so much fun. Thank you so much. It was great uh, fun. And uh, thank you for listening, everyone. And we'll see you next Tuesday. See you next Tuesday. Bye. 